Welcome back, everybody, to Yang Speaks. It's your favorite co-hosts that are not named Andrew Yang. You've got Zach Brownman and Carly Riley, which we do every Thursday. We're coming at you live from St. Lucia. Not Thursday. live. Coming at you not live from St. Lucia. You're right. We're coming at you from St. <laughs> Lucia. And because we're on vacation and we would we want to do this on the beach, but the water was too loud and the audio wouldn't work. So you're stuck. Our lives are too fabulous. We're too fabulous. We're not very good. No, busy. not at all. Um, but we are on vacation and it's wonderful. And here we are working, hustling. So today's pod, we want to do three things. First of all, in the news today, it's a lot about Afghanistan. It's a lot about Hurricane Ida. First of all, thoughts and prayers going into everyone that is navigating that situation. But we're not a thoughts and prayers podcast. We're a podcast of action. So I wanted to highlight a few charities that are doing excellent work helping those in need right now. Uh, podcasts of action. So we'll talk about that. Number two. It was a fascinating article written by Matthew Iglesias or on Matthew Iglesias' substack. Keith Humphreys. Keith Humphreys talking about the changing demographics, both of who's getting arrested in the United States and our, who is doing the arresting, what our police force is looking like. And it's something that's not getting covered. We wanted to dive in. And then in conjunction with that, number three, there's a program in Georgia that is teaching cops how to do jujitsu. And the results are mind-blowing in terms of how effective they are um, in a number of different ways. So I want to break all those down. And it's a topic that's not getting a lot of air cover when everybody in the world is talking about a whole bunch of things. And we want to bring you something new. Am I right, Carl? Are we ready to dive in? Let's dive in. Starting with charities, what's going on in the world? Yeah. Um, so you had highlighted something to me that Airbnb is doing some really cool work to help people host refugees from Afghanistan. Yeah. So people may have seen this headline, which is that Airbnb agreed – to allocate 20,000 residences, spaces, et cetera, for Afghan refugees. But on top of that, they have now opened this program up so that if you are an Airbnb host or even if you are not, you can now go on and through Airbnb offer up a spare bedroom, a spare house, a spare apartment, whatever, for Afghan refugees. So it's something you and I are looking into. We have a spare room. We're very fortunate. So we're very interested in in putting that out there and, and seeing if somebody needs a home in, the, in New York. Um, and I would just encourage others to check that out. We'll share the link below. Yep. But I, I really feel very strongly that we have a moral obligation to help people who are escaping the Taliban right now for reasons that were somewhat U.S. created. Not entirely, but somewhat U.S. created, certainly. It's, it's airbnb.org slash refugees. Um, but if you go to airbnb.org, you can find it. Um, Bill Maher did a rant saying that it, Americans should welcome Afghan refugees with open arms. And then he joked that everybody is agreeing with that, saying everybody that's not me should open their doors to refugees. And Carly and I are like, well, if we can, we should. So we're going to try to. I, I don't want to say here, like, we're definitely doing it because we haven't gotten there yet. It's... Um, we also have to see if there's, you know, if, if there if there's need in New York City, right? Part of this is geogra like geographic, like where are yeah. Afghan refugees ending up? But we're going to try. And if not, we're going to donate. So um, I encourage you guys that um, I think it's a good source of real action. And if you do want to donate, uh, IRC, the International Rescue Committee, committee, I believe it is, the IRC um, is a good organization to donate to uh, if you want to help Afghanistan without you know, opening a home or if you can't open a home. Um, so that's uh, uh, Sam Harris actually highlighted that on his podcast. And then the second thing, our thoughts and prayers are out to everyone who's been, who's had to evacuate, who's had their home damage from Hurricane Ida. This is a bad one. Um, and there's a number, you got to be careful with disaster relief charities because uh, they can spring up and then basically just steal your money. Um, but the disaster relief organization I've always loved is something called Team Rubicon. I'll put the link in our bio, but what it is, it's these ex-Marines who came back with all this like combat training and want to use their practical good and now both themselves and then they train other former military vets who have combat experience and they attack disaster relief like you would attack like with army tactics, if you will. Um, Hyper effective, good use of costs and good use of like, let's call it talented people on the ground helping those in need. So Team Rubic Rubicon is what it's called. Um, we'll put the link in the bio. They have a special donation link you'll see for the hurricane victims. Um, right now so anyway podcast of action this is what we're doing we encourage you guys to not just say thoughts and prayers and not just tweet thoughts and prayers not just post on your instagram but actually donate um or give something and give you time so that's our encouragement that's how we're starting the podcast today do something good second thing we want to talk about is something that matthew iglesias substack highlighted which 
in our opinion, Carl, not getting enough press. Um, there was a port, report earlier this year from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, but I did not know existed, frankly, the BJS. Um, and it had a crazy stat. It was the main takeaway is that Hispanic Americans were slightly less likely to be jailed than white Americans in 2019. Um, so basically the rate of probation in 2000 um, and the rate of being on parole was um, substantially higher in 2000 than it was uh, in 2016 to 2019 is going down. Um, so you have a, I'll make sure I get this number right. The By 2016, the probation disparity had disappeared and the parole disparity had shrunk by 85% between Hispanics and whites. So Hispanic rate of being incarcerated decreased by 60% since 2000. And furthermore, in this article, there are now more Hispanic cops. Basically, between 1997 and 2016, the proportion of police officers who were black remained stable. So in those 19 years, you didn't yes. see a, a proportionate increase in black cops. However, the, there was a, a huge proportionate increase in the number of Hispanic cops. It was 61%. Um, and so this article, and Keith Humphreys in this, says that this helps to explain why you had you know, a, a rise in the number of Hispanics who were expressing either, quote, a lot or, quote, a great deal of trust in police. Um, I think you have the numbers on that, but it, it was like 49% of Hispanics said that they had a lot or a great deal of trust in police. And so for context, that's still obviously less than 50%. Uh, but white Americans say ha ha have trust in police at, at a level of like 56%. So your 49% versus 56% is not a huge gap. Um, and whereas African Americans, Black Americans, trust police at rates of like 27%, or say that they have a lot or a great deal of trust in police at about 27%. And, and why we were interested in this, and I think you, we can break this down, is that in politics in particular and in the press, you hear a lot about black and brown communities and their either frustration or injustices dealing in dealing with our criminal justice system, which of course have been true. But by the numbers, you're not looking at that equally distributed across races. You're looking at it where the Hispanic population are seeing more Hispanic cops and more trust um for, within, cops. for those cops and therefore over time less arrests um of hispanic well I, I, you made that causational and it could go the other way like who knows which direct like which comes first You're right? right therefore is not the word i want but, to say but so we've got three things happening at once right which is you have more hispanic cops you have higher rates you have more hispanics saying that they have a lot of trust in cops mm -hmm. and you have fewer hispanics being jailed uh, uh, less than you have white americans um which is is really interesting and and i think there's political ramifications here. Like the reason that we want to talk about this is because from a strategic perspective, I think it, it, I hate to say it, but like further makes the case against the defund the police movement. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I think a, a tendency, as you just said, Zach, to lump in black and brown people when we're talking about defund the police or some of these call it more radical criminal justice reform initiatives. Uh, and I don't think that's actually reflective. In fact, by the polling numbers, it's not reflective of what many brown communities are feeling or thinking. So there's a press narrative on defund the police in that it's um, driven by black and brown voters. And I think those numbers are wrong. Um, I don't think they're wrong. I, I know they're wrong because here they are. Um, so USA Today, to, USA Today did a poll in May of this year. Um, I guess it was they released it in May. It was done in March. But in this year, it said 18, only 18% 18 of respondents supported the movement known as defund the police. And almost 60% say they oppose it. Um, so white Americans and Republicans are much more likely to oppose it. Only 28% of black Americans support it and 34% of Dems support it. So um, why are we bringing this up? The reason this election was close, the 2020 election, was because Biden thought he was going to roll in Florida, and he did not. And the biggest reason was Miami-Dade County, which has a strong Hispanic population. And if you're looking at data that's saying there's a stronger trust with the Hispanic community and the police department and a large Democratic movement to defund the police, there's a disparity there. And the Democrats are going to lose if they don't focus on that. And it's fascinating to see... Frankly, your point, Carly, the political ramifications of this and what it means for the future. Now, I'll jump in and say 
none of this is to say that we don't have major issues with police brutality or that things are great. I mean, again, yes. we're we're we got issues, highlighting the girl. fact that forty nine percent of Hispanics say they have a lot of trust for cops. Like that's <laughs> that's, that's still less than half of the community. Um, so the other thing we wanted to do on this show is talk a little bit about maybe some solutions that are out there. And I want to shout out our listener, Kevin Say. I apologize if I'm pronouncing your last name incorrectly, but credit to you. You commented to me about this or to us about this in one of the YouTube comments, and then you followed up on Twitter. So I want to say thank you for bringing this to our attention, which is thank the you, use Kevin. of BJJ, which is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, the way that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is being used to train police officers um, in I want to call it hand-to-hand combat, but I feel like that sort of gives the wrong impression because this isn't just for only being used in combat. Keeping but, us safe, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first thing I want to say to maybe kick this off, Zach, and then you you can dive in with some of what, what you've learned on this, is what I found really fascinating is police forces today are have mandatory training when it comes to using a gun, which makes sense, but they are not required to go through any sort of training when it comes to how to handle someone physically by hand. So, and, and that is the much more common scenario than needing to shoot somebody. So it's it's sort of no wonder that you see these scenarios where you have cops like punching people, beating people. I'm not justifying it at all. But when you're in this live situation and you've had absolutely no training on how to handle it, you're going to see outcomes like what we see. So that was what initially got me really excited about this BJJ and these trainings uh, is I, I think that there's clearly a gap right now in the way that we're training our police forces. So on the president's show, Yang talked about jujitsu for cops, which sounds a little ridiculous. Like you're going to make all the cops black belts or whatever. <laughs> like it sounds <laughs> yeah. stupid, but. Um, or it sounds terrifying if you're somebody. Or who strange. Thinks that, yeah. yeah if you, I mean, if you think that cops inherently join the force because they have a violent streak and they want to be violent towards people, th- this may sound terrifying. I- I'm of the impression that most cops are not do not join for that reason, don't want to hurt people, but just have not been given the tools they need to successfully handle particular situations. Right. And so end up doing something really bad. Uh. We've talked about this in this podcast for is that, so the defund the police movement is like, on one hand, in many local cities, it's the largest budgetary expense, right? Mm. Um, so it seem, And if it's not working, then defunding makes it good. You know, like you shouldn't be pouring more money into a broken program. But that said, there is a really interesting argument to be putting more resources into better training um, and development of our police officers. And the average training in the United States for a cop is about 21 weeks, which sounds like a decent amount of training, but that's about what I got, um, frankly, being a lifeguard. Um, like there's a little more. And then being a hairdresser is two years. Um, oh my God. <laughs> and nothing against hairdressers. I, I know that I think it's important to have, I know that, but cops. The point is weapons. that yeah, um, cops should have more training. So, um, so what's crazy about so here's what how we got in this jujitsu thing. So our supporter Kevin flagged this for us, and then Bryant Gumble on HBO yeah. Real Sports did a whole special on this. Um, and here's the stats from this because it's crazy. So they did this in uh, Marietta, Georgia. Where was it? Yeah, I think uh, that's yeah, right. Marietta, Georgia. Um, and 95 of the 145 police officers have opted into this thing. Um, and they get one class a week. And here's what they saw. Injuries to suspects were reduced by 53%. So if someone was a suspect of a crime compared to what they were normally, in, you know, the normal injury rate for a cop arresting someone or tracking someone down, that decreased by 53%. And injuries to officers down by about the same percent, 48%. So safer. Um, and you were 200% more likely to get injured by a non-jujitsu officer. So what they were talking about in this piece was like, we're not talking about being able to like, karate chop your way to knock someone out it's it's the boring stuff in mma fighting it's headlocks and holds um and grips and i I actually i I talked to some folks who have been trained in martial arts and i think part of what it is too is if you feel like you're in control of a situation you're going to be calmer as an officer which means you're you're less likely i can i can destroy you right like we're talking about headlocks which can sound violent but you're talking about a safe non- injurious, non-lethal way to subdue somebody so that you as the cop feel like, okay, 
I, I, I feel I know my training. I can handle this situation. So there was actually video footage in this Brian Gumble piece of an officer who was arresting somebody who used their jujitsu training and who who then started talking to the suspect they had on the ground and saying, hey, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And they interviewed that officer afterwards and said, was that something you you ever would have done prior to this BJJ training? And he was like, never. But I felt calm because there, there's also a, just a mental breathing, et cetera, yeah. component to mixed martial arts. He said, I felt calm and I felt in control. So I felt like I was in a place to actually reassure this, this suspect, Correct. which was fascinating. I, I will link to the Brian Gumble piece. It's really worth watching. Hey, real talk real quick. How is your mental health? Mine hasn't been great in the pandemic. Post-pandemic, it's getting better. And that's why Andrew and I are proud to say that BetterHelp sponsors this podcast because BetterHelp is a very easy way to get professional counseling done securely and professionally online. So whether it's something interfering with your happiness or something preventing you from achieving your goals, for me, I talk to my therapist, I call it like pulling off my steam valve. I just talk about, just let off a little steam and talk about everything we're navigating in the world. So you can send a message to a counselor at any time. You can start communicating under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not really self-help, but it's professional counseling done securely online and it's available across the world. So whether you're struggling with depression or professional issues or anger or stress or family, uh, I got plenty of that, although I love my fam, um, relationships or sleeping or self-esteem, you name it, anything you share is confidential and you can talk about all these things conveniently, professionally and affordably in all 50 states and nationwide. So I want you to start living a happier life today. I want you to take charge of your mental health today. And as a listener of Yank Speech, you're going to get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash yank. So join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash yank. I th- so then the data on this in this study, which was done by an independent like university, is w- wonderful. 77% less tasers. Um, they're just using their taser less. Um, less officer injuries, as I, mess- less, as I mentioned, less suspect injuries. And the other thing, it's cheaper. Like if, we wanna, if we're going to support the defund the police, it's actually cheaper. So they're saving a net savings of $40,000, $41,000 in this program. Um, and they did it for 95 officers. So... Um, and there was one, the other, to be full transparency, there was one training injury. So one of the 95 officers got injured in training. It is, you know, it's combat. Um, but this to me seems like we should be doing it all over the place, which it sounds ridiculous. It's like, let's teach them all to be black belts. But realistically, that's kind of what we want. We want that like calm Zen Yoda master to take charge of a situation. Well, and, and, we? and separating it out, I mean, going back to my point earlier, not to be a broken record, but like, if most of what cops are dealing with is having to put their hands on a person, the fact that they are not being trained on how to safely and competently put their hands on someone is, if you take it from that angle, this makes all the sense in the world, mm-hmm. right? Like, of course, we need to be teaching cops how to do something that they are going to face with 100% certainty at some point during their career as a cop. Um, now, I, the, the last thing I'll say, and they, they say this in the Brian Gumble piece, right? We're, we're not saying this is a catch-all. This is not like we suddenly solved police brutality problems. No, we or, solved it. Or solved welcome, the trust America. in communities. <laughs> yeah, it's done. Harley and Zach. A <laughs> couple of white people. Solved it. <laughs> but, but I do Jiu-jitsu. think that uh, this is a really compelling solution that can at least get us a step closer to where we want to be as a world. Yeah. Um, Tool in the toolbox. Anything that keeps cops from bringing out their weapon more often should be a good thing. Um, Absolutely. And, as long and, as they can, you know, I mean, there are times when weapons are needed. And I think cops should have the um, ability and training to know when and how to do that. But there should be way more options. Um, and it's interesting because one of the, I would say, valid parts of the defund the police movement, because I think there there's the part of the defund the police movement that's truly abolitionism, where they say, hey, we want to defund we want to get rid of police forces. And then there's a part of the defund the police movement that will say, no, no, we're just saying like less funding, mm-hmm. you know, we don't. And and then something that I find very legitimate, which is cops shouldn't be responding to mental health calls 
necessarily. Mm. Or there's all sorts of scenarios in which you have, if you have other sorts of task forces, so to speak, that can respond to different situations, we'd be better off. And I agree with that. And I see this as actually part of that as well, which is now if you have a cop responding to a mental health situation, instead of getting aggressive with that person or feeling like they have to punch them to subdue them, which you should never feel, but happens. And I frankly understand, like you, you now have training to safely handle somebody who's having a mental yeah. health crisis or, or outbreak or trying to attack you because they're mentally ill. Uh, so there's just so much to this that I I mean, really look, we've love. given our cops 20 weeks of training, a gun, a stick, and a taser yeah. and said, go keep us safe. Like there's we it's just got to get better at this. It's crazy. Um, and you can uh, call this radical to say, but I think there's a there's just a better way to keep us safe. I it's genuinely just, think I, I don't I don't see I don't know who could look at these results and look at these numbers and yeah. like offhand be like I completely disagree with this. Yeah, the, the, the the pushback I see is people who believe or who think that cops inherently get into it for bad violent reasons, which by the way exists, right? You have people who are sadistic for whom being a cop then becomes a compelling path and you do have higher percentages of white supremacy in in yep. military and cops etc right but i i think to paint the whole police force that way is is totally off base but there are people who, who see it that way so if, if you're somebody who sees it like that then you're probably opposed to this because you support abolitionism other than that who could be opposed to this i mean the numbers are really really striking and it just makes sense like it, it given it just makes sense <laughs> yeah well look <laughs> longer training theoretically in a heavier investment in training would weed out the nazis and the shitty people so um theoretically theoretically um, anyway so wanted to bring that to y'all's forefront because look more into it watch the bryant gumbel piece i, I really Sports, would bryant love gumbel. to see more of a movement around this thank you again kevin for bringing this to our attention i love it and keep dming us or keep adding us on twitter yeah. with new stuff because there's stuff that this is remarkable news, in my opinion. And it's a cool, like both the report was cool and this jujitsu piece is cool. And it's not Nobody's cutting through the mainstream enough. So we're hoping to contribute and add a little fuel to that fire. Okay. Last thing I want to close. So we are not a, um, we're not a bougie podcast or bougie people, but we do have bougie, some bougie friends. And I want to give a shout mm. out to uh, our former traveling press secretary, Eric Sanchez, who's very bougie. Love you, death brother. Um <laughs> And Randy Jones, who's less bougie, he's from West Virginia, but he likes the bouge too. Uh, he was our political director on the presidential campaign. They sent us a bottle of champagne. We are holding them up. Podcast, but now we are. Here we are. Cheers I love you guys. In. We love you both. And I mean, you want to talk about just amazing people. So Sanchez lives in New Orleans. He is currently evacuated his home for Hurricane Ida. And amidst all of that, sent, sent us, us a bottle of champagne. Which is just it's supposed like, to speak to the kind of people you they are. A bottle I know. of whiskey it, to drown your sorrows. Like it's not, yeah, I actually they're just fantastic people. But I don't know so where Eric his address Sanchez, is because he's evacuated. It's that kind of guy. What a guy. Um, Randy Jones, we love you both. We're drinking champagne to you yeah. right now. Now here's the deal, and I want to close this because Carly and I had a fight on this. A little couple fight for you. For oh my god. I don't even know what this fight is. I don't know what you're gonna try and argue you here. Know, you know. You know. I know vaguely the topic, so, but I don't understand your argument. We so we're in St. Lucha and um, I'll leave the name of the resort. Um, we tried to find like an all exclusive, just like turn off for two weeks. And as we record a podcast turning on um, and the first resort was, you know, I, I think they're struggling with COVID, but it was like not great. Like the food was tough. You Here's how I would time. describe it. It felt like they had their heyday in like the 1980s and like it was a really nice resort then. And they just like haven't really updated Maybe it. Maybe like or the early 2000s. It but since yeah. then. Fine. All right. Yeah. It's the, it hasn't been 40 but years. But it was a little dated. Years. And Carly said this place is chintzy. And I, being an idiot, apparently, don't know what that word means or is. And so. Carly's not happy. She said this place is chintzy. And I didn't know what chintzy meant. I think I, I was describing the bedding. I said the bedding was the bedding, chintzy. Whatever. And I said, what does chintzy mean? And she said, it means... I said cheap and unsubstantial, which cheap and unsubstantial, was not cheap and perfect, pop. but was pretty close. So, so for me, I'm like, well, why don't you say the word cheap or unsubstantial? And this is our relationship in a nutshell, I think, because instead yeah. of having a rational conversation around whether or not we should find a new resort and like problem solving around that. We're debating whether or not it's okay to, to use clear, an SAT vocab word to describe your discomfort. Uh, I did find us a new resort. You did great. And we but you used the word chintzy. And this is my thing. And this is where I'm going to go off a bit. I understand SAT vocab words 
and they're important for your testing, I guess. But I don't understand their use in real life because why would one use a word like chintzy where the vast majority of people don't understand what that word means when it just means cheap? Use the word cheap. No, because everyone uh, knows what cheap means and no one cares about the artistic nuance of your phrase. (laughs) No, 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 because cheap and chintzy are are, are slightly different. I know there's a whole bunch of different things, but they mean the same thing. Zach, first of all, it's literally in the definition. This is so stupid. Go I, ahead. I, 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 I don't even know what your argument is that people should use the most, the simplest, most reductive word in yes. any scenario. We should just not any. Scenario, we should devolve in everyday conversation. So, sure, sure, we should devolve as a species to having less nuance in our. Well, you and I talk all the time about the problem in the press and their inability to capture nuance or to understand things in gray terms. And now you're arguing that we should simplify our language to its like most to, to only the simplest words. And get and have less nuance in our language. It's so crazy. I'm arguing. No, and, and then my second point is: think of all these other languages, right? Like Schadenfreude is a, is a common word that the United States, has, like English speakers, have adopted. But that's a German word that means when you revel in somebody else's misery. Right? No one knows that word. Okay, but my point being that 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 actually is a a feeling that people have, right? Reveling in somebody else's misery. Yeah, but saying you can reveling use in somebody else's misery is a much longer way of saying it than Schadenfreude. My then point, Schadenfreude, my, not by that much. My point, well, my point with all this is that you have other languages have words for feelings, situations that we can't express in English, and I think it would be great to only increasingly be able to excru- to to verbalize those things and to have words to describe those things. So I, I'm just the argument that we should all like just make our language simpler and simpler and simpler. And by the way. Why do you get to draw the line? Because there are people who are who have a less formed vocab than you do. Like, is it just nuts? I truthfully, if I'd known this was going to be the full debate, I just would have said no because I don't want to embarrass you this badly. But- wow, look at that! <laughs> Think she's put me in a casket. Well, uh, I'm sorry that no one gives a shit about your Ivy League education and the I fancy didn't get words an Ivy you League use. Education. We use the word cheap. Chintzy's not a word people understand, and every time you use it, you either making someone feel dumb, or we no, waste more time by I someone saying, "Hey, what do you mean by chintzy? chintzy?" And then you say "cheap" and unsubstantiated. Hey, you didn't. I didn't interrupt you. You say "cheap." What do you mean by chintzy? Say, "Oh, I meant cheap and unsubstantiated, or cheap and a poor quality." And then my natural reaction was, "Why didn't we say that?" It was like, "Well, because chintzy is the more apt word." Like. Is it? Because you know what? We have to re-explain it every time. And this is the problem. You're evolving too far. There is a happy medium. I agree with you that I should not be the one drawing the line. But someone has to, and no one's taking the bull by the horns. So I'm saying chintzy is probably where the line starts. This is Trying crazy. to figure out what's next. This is truly madness. I mean, I guess you guys can tell us whether or not you think I should, I don't know, yeah, what, be allowed to use the word chintzy. chintzy. Ridiculous. By the way, you used the word apt as you're describing me and like, like I said apt. apt? When did I use apt? What well, a tape. Thank God we have the tape. Whatever. <laughs> you said chintzy is, is a more apt word than saying cheap and unsubstantiated, which you're right. It is a more apt I word. I think I said that. Doesn't sound like me. Well, because chintzy is the more apt word. Like, is it? Anyway. Oh, I'm point. so glad that this fight that we're now having is recorded because this is what Put I deal with. On, but usually fly. it's not recorded. So pe- I can't force you to see this that you said exactly what This is our relationship in a nutshell. <laughs> Don't let her think she won, folks. <laughs> Don't let her get away with chintzy. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. Anyway, we love you guys. We'll see you next Thursday. Yeah. Happy Labor Day for those of you who celebrate that, whatever that means. We'll be celebrating in St. Yes. Lucia with thank Eric, you to Eric Sanchez and Randy, and Randy Jones. Also, I, I really want to say thank you to everyone who listens to this. I'm, I'm like, truly, like, I'm so grateful that I, I know we're not Yang. And uh, I'm just really, really grateful to all of you who listen and who DM me and who engage with the show. Like, I can't tell you how happy it makes me and, and how grateful I am to, to all of you and uh, so anyways we do love you a little, and we a know that you're note. you're here for um they're here for your vocab words we know that <laughs> they're right, here for love you guys enjoy the week cheers cheers <laughs>